Good, uh, good afternoon. Uh, for those of you who do not know me, my name is Ali Kujuri. I'm uh, an adjunct professor at the Department of uh, Engineering Science and uh, one of the organizers of this lecture series. On behalf of the department and also the School of Science and Technology, I would like to welcome you all, especially our guest speaker, to this 10th uh, lecture uh, uh, in this academic year and uh, 145th lecture uh, in the series since we started in 2006. Uh, bef uh, before I uh, start uh, the uh, introduction of our uh, guest speaker, let me mention that uh, uh, Kate has ordered pizza and uh, it's going to arrive at uh, 5.30. I hope you enjoy having it. It was really good. It comes from the, the student center. And then uh, uh, since there is a class uh, starting at 6 o'clock, uh, we need to uh, get out of here uh, maybe a few minutes before 6 so that uh, we can clean up for the next class. Next, uh, our uh, next lecture uh, will be on, the, uh, uh, on uh, April the 4th, and the uh, uh, title of the talk is Passive Optical Networks, Technology for Broadband Access to the Home, by Dr. Rajiv Deek. Uh, he's a senior product line manager in, in Broadcom, Peluma. Our guest speaker for today is Mr. Mark uh, Baldassari, and the title of his talk is Grid Voltage Regulation with Distributed Energy Resources. Mr. Mark Baldassari has over four, 34 years experience in engineering and product development and over 10 years with uh, Enphase Energy, where he holds, he holds the position of Director uh, of Codes and Standards. Currently, he actively participates in a number of codes and standards development groups with internationally and uh, domestically organizations. He is uh, very, very involved with the drafting of the 2020 National Electric Code for Article 690 and Chairman for Article 705. Mr. Baldassari has a bachelor's degree from uh, uh, California State University in Sacramento in electrical and electronic engineering. This is, in fact, his th third time that uh, he's here. And the reason that I invited him is that uh, both the solar energy and the conversion of, I mean, of, of solar to electrical energy is really important, you know, in, in, the, in the, I mean, I'm talking about the inverters and so forth, and we really need to understand that. So uh, uh, he, he has also been uh, uh, very generous in uh, providing, uh, I mean, tours uh, every semester, I mean, for like four semesters. Uh, this, I mean, I think we are already there. Uh, we have, uh, he, he was uh, generous to offer us to host the, uh, the tour for us, and we thank you very much. So let's give him a, a hand, and then please come over. Well, thank you. Um, uh, I feel honored to be here uh, today with you guys, because uh, it's, it, you know, this is a subject matter to me that, that's near and dear to my heart, and to be able to share it with you guys is, is always an experience. You know, the people at work don't appreciate it, like you guys do. But anyways, today I want to talk about, I, I work for a company called Enphase Energy. We make power inverters. We convert the DC power from a solar module to AC power. And in some of the other talks I've, I've given, I've described how that process works. But one of the other key aspects of this is that the output of the inverter connects to the grid. And it's this grid interaction that uh, I really want to talk about today. And one of the uh, interesting things is how inverters can help regulate the voltage on the grid. So maybe we'll get. There we go. All right. So grid voltage regulation with distributed energy resources. So that is distributed energy resources, anything that, that generates power. And that could be a PV uh, inverter, that could be a wind turbine, that could be hydroelectric. That could be uh, a Tesla battery in a car that's 
exporting power to the grid. Anything that connects that generates, that generates energy. Um, so these are some of the objectives. I, I'm, well, hopefully that you guys will be able to answer this, these questions. This is going to be like the easiest test you ever take because I'm going to give you all the questions and I'm going to give you all the answers. So you'll have everything. <laughs> Um, but anyway, so we're going we're gonna to talk about what is a microinverter. I'll just touch upon that real quickly. Uh, then, you know, I want to I talk about how we connect that power to the grid. Um, what are the problems when we have a lot of distributed energy, uh, distributed energy generation, when you have a high penetration of DER, um, how we can mitigate these effects, and then how beer is associated with VARs. Maybe you already know that one, but we'll, we'll talk about that. Uh, so a microinverter system. Um, uh, first of all, talk a little bit, just general comments about solar. It's, um, you know, of course, it, it covers the planet. Um, and what's interesting is that uh, enough sunlight falls on the Earth every hour to meet the world's energy demand for a whole year. So there's a lot of energy coming down. This is, you know, it's all over. Now, it wouldn't be very practical to cover the whole globe with solar panels, but you can see that if you distribute those around smartly, uh, you know, you could, you could really do a good job in providing all your needs. And Thomas Edison had a pretty good comment about that, is that, you know, it's a great source of power and we don't want to wait for oil and coal to run out before we start using it. So this is kind of the basic understanding of, of what PV does. We have the sun, it's shining light onto these, um, uh, photovoltaic modules that generate, they're like a, it's like a battery in a way. I mean, it, it, it's a DC voltage. In fact, each one of those cells is like a, like a battery and all those are in series. So that boosts up the voltage. So a typical 60 cell module is about 35 volts DC. Um, there are larger modules. And then you can take those modules and put them in series to generate higher voltages and put them in parallel to increase current and so forth. But anyways, the idea is that the PV module generates DC um, voltage up to a certain current level, so you get an amount of power out of it. And then we hook it up to an inverter. And the inverter's function is to take that DC and convert it to AC. And then we want to take that AC and do something with it. We want to connect it into our house or into the grid so that we can plug into the wall over here on the and, and we can get some power out of it. So that's that's the key. And it's that. It's that interface of the AC side that I really want to kind of focus on. Um, so here's, here's a typical, this is how Enphase works. We have um, each one of the solar modules up on the roof has an inverter associated with it. It's a pretty small inverter. It's, um, you know, it's, you know, I don't know, about yay big. You know, four inches by six inches or so. Um, it's, you know, about an inch and a half thick. Uh, it's pretty, you know, kind of smallish. Um, and, but it's able to convert that uh, DC power uh, from each one of the modules, and then it generates AC power. And as you can see there from this um, green conductor here, we, we kind of connect them together. They're actually connected in parallel. And uh, so all that power then comes down to the load center. The load center is where you have your circuit breakers. You know, um, uh, you have your, you know, all your, your branch circuits uh, go to a series of outlets in your house, and then you might have a branch a branch circuit breaker that goes up onto the roof to get your PV. And then also the utility network connects into that, uh, you know, through the meter. This is how we traditionally get power. But it's this interaction here between the utility network and the PV that we're going to focus on. So some of the other things that uh, Enphase sells, we have a full system. We have uh, the PV module. Uh, we don't actually make the modules, but we have inverters on the roof. We also have energy management systems that help uh, manage large loads like smart thermostats, things like that, so you can control um, your usage. We also have storage, uh, which is batteries. We have lithium ion batteries, um, and that might be a good topic one year. We could dive into that a little bit deeper. And then we have control. We have a way of um, putting all these pieces together uh, through a microprocessor. We have a web interface, uh, so you can get access to it outside. So. This whole thing is um, what we do at Enphase. But let's talk about utility power distribution. Uh, of course, you know, the way it works today, um, you know, and it's been working for years, we have power generation, you have some kind of gas-fired plant, coal plant, nuclear plant. Then there's transmission lines. You've seen the tall towers out there. 
Um, they take the power to a distribution substation, and we're real close to a, a nice substation. It's um, Old Adobe and Freitas Road. There's a big substation down there. Go take a look at it. And then, of course, that, that is, th these are really high voltage lines here, like 100,000 volts-ish, and then uh, they, they, they're down into the thousands of volts. That there's a transformer in this distribution center that takes it down to thousands of volts uh, to your, your power lines above your head or under the ground. And then there's a group of transformers that drops that down to the 120 volts or 240 volts that you have in your house. So that's kind of just kind of the basics of the power distribution infrastructure. Um, so if we take a look at that with uh, what happens is that we have, we have our distribution here, we've got our, our power lines, we have our transformers here. Uh, so here's our distribution station. These are distribution feeders. Then we have um, uh, transformers. A lot of people call them cans because they look like a can. And then they, they feed to each one of the houses. And so you've, like I said, you've got the transmission lines that are hundred thousands of volts. These distribution lines feeders are uh, thousands of volts and now we're down to hundreds of volts down into the house. And what happens is with the feeder um, is that as you work your way further down the, the line, the voltage drops because we're pulling current. We're, we, we have a, a voltage drop at this node we have an, and we're pulling more current. We're playing, at, at this node you have this first current plus a second current. So we have a lot of voltage drop, actually, and a third current. But each one of these sections we get a voltage drop and eventually the voltage dips towards the end. Yeah? Quick question. What is the current capability of those transformers? It, it all depends on the size they are. You mean the, the ones here on the... For a, for, for on a, residential that area. These on the, the poles are like 5,000 watts. Okay. Yeah, kind of. Or, I mean, every single one's different. Like a cul-de-sac, for instance, where you'd have, say, five homes on it or more, there'll be one that's mounted on the ground, let's say. That, that maybe underground, there's a cul-de-sac. I mean, they're, they're you know, know, three feet on each side. Maybe that's 25 kilowatts or something. And a lot of those are oil-cooled. Um, they have passive cooling. They're, the transformer windings themselves are submerged into a bath of oil. And then there's fins on the outside that that oil circulates through to uh, cool off. So yeah, look for those things as you're, you're driving around. I mean, I'm always looking up at power lines nowadays and going, oh wow, look at that, look at that switch up there. Oh geez, there's a VAR compensator, you know. But yeah, take a look at it, take notice of it because there's a lot of cool stuff up there on, on those power poles. So anyways, we, we have this voltage drop problem. And the way the utilities deal with this is at the, at the um, distribution center, they boost up the voltage above nominal and let it drop as it goes down. And so they, they stay within the range that they operate. And there's an ANSI, A-N-S-I standard that all the utilities follow uh, to regulate the voltage. They have to stay within a certain range. There's ANSI range A and ANSI range B, ANSI range C. Um, so anyway, so they're, they're under obligation through the you know, regulatory bodies to maintain uh, proper regulation. Yeah, yeah. Mike, mm -hmm. are these uh, three-phase transformers? Or because some of the houses may need to 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 right. uh, to uh, phase it. Right? Two phases. So, right. if it is, um, and I kind of show that here. Here's a transformer here that's hooked up. It's kind of hard to see in, on the screen here, but it's hooked up to L2 and L3. So the three-phase system. Um, uh, I was going to go into that a little bit, but uh, it's it's a it's a three-phase vector. So you have, um, well, that pen's not working too good. So this is a three-phase system. There's a, it's 120 degrees apart. And this is say L1, L2, L3. And the, each one of these is 120 degrees, 120 degrees. And um, the, uh, the voltage from line to line is some, some voltage, and this voltage here um, is a voltage divided by the square root of three. So let's say that um, uh, I have 208 volts across here. This would be 120 volts. It's just some Pythagorean theorems that work those things out. But um, that's, it's, the way distribution is usually done is in three phases. And the advantage of three-phase is that you can transmit more power 
uh, on the three wires than you could if you just had two. Because I get the square root of three factor in my favor. So I get more power with three wires than I do with two or four. So anyway, so that's, that's kind of the idea of three phase. Um, it has some other really cool features like when you're pulling power out, power's constant and some other things, but uh, you know. But anyways, this is, this is typical. Uh, in, in the U.S., you might have uh, three-phase 208 volts, line to line, and line to neutral would be 120 volts. What you get in your house is actually um, is, a, is a vector that's at 180 degrees apart, um, which is you have neutral, line one, line two. This is 240 volts, and this is 120 volts. You can, uh, you can transform, if I hook up a transformer between here and here, I can transform to make this one. Um, and you just, this is just a center tap off a of secondary. So I'd have my primary and then my secondary. L1, neutral, L2, and this could hook up to, you know, uh, we'll call it something different, phase one, phase two, up here, or phase three. Three. So I can, I can get that um, 240 volts out of it. And that's what you have. Our houses are wired up that way 90% of the time. There are some apartment complexes that run three-phase to the apartment, and then they only run 200, 208 volts to uh, each one of the units. It's cheaper for them to do that. And, uh, but your dryer won't dry close as fast because it's at a lower voltage. It really makes a difference. Your motor will run slower. <laughs> anyway, so, so this is the problem here we have with this distributed um, loads is that uh, as you go down the line, the voltage is dropping. Now let's say we add solar to the whole thing. Well, solar is generating energy, okay? It's generating power. And it's um, during the day when the sun is out, it's at its peak <coughs> and most of us are at work our load is low, so eventually you start feeding current back, backwards. Um, and what that tends to do is it starts to rise the voltage out here on the end. And that's a bit of a problem. Uh, you have some pretty wide extremes between the fully loaded case and this fully generated case. Um, and I, I say here, voltage rise, voltage rise occurs as PV generator increases and load decreases. So as I said, the load is going down because you're at work, at school, but the PV is increasing, it's the middle of the day, and your voltage will rise. So, and, and the reason why it rises is because of impedance. And um, what in, it's impedance of those, those uh, distribution feeders. Um, and what is impedance? Well, I got it right off of Wikipedia. It's, it's, it extends the concept of resistance to AC circuit and possesses both magnitude and phase, unlike resistance, which is only magnitude. So it has a, a reactive component to it. It's a resistive and a reactive element. And um, that's what causes the drop and the rise. Um, voltage, voltage drop and rise is due to the resistance reactive elements. And um, so we, we you know, if we want to try to address some of these voltage issues, we can't change the resistive element of that wire. We can't do that. It, it's, we're stuck with that. Whatever the resist, our loss is, that's what it is. We can't change it. But we can um, uh, change the reactive part <coughs> by presenting the complex conjugate um, of, of whatever it is. So if it's a, you know, minus J85, we can put plus J85 in there. So we can, we can compensate for the reactive element, and that has a, the ability to actually um, regulate the voltage. Um, this compensation is called VAR compensation, and um, inverters accomplish this by injecting or m absorbing VARs. And, um, and like I said, VAR compensation only affects the reactive element. We can't really change the resistive one, but we can affect the reactive element. So what is, what is a VAR? VAR stands for Volt Ampere Reactive. And uh, if we were to take a look at power, it's actually 
um, you know, we have real power, we have reactive power, and we have apparent power. And those are expressed in a, in a triangular form if we look at the axes. We have our reactive axes, we have our real power axes, and then the, the hypotenuse of that uh, combination is the, is the apparent power. Um, apparent power is measured in VA, volt amperes. Um, active power is measured in watts. We're pretty familiar with that, 100 watt light bulb, 100 watts. And then the reactive power is measured in VARs, and that's volt ampere reactive. And, and, and I have this beer analogy here. Um, here's a, 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 you know, a, a glass of beer, and um, the VARs do, you know, like the foam in the beer, the VARs do no work. Um, they, they're, they're actually the magnetization of, of elements for, say, a motor or the mag magnetization energy of a transformer. Those are the VARs, those are the reactive elements. They don't do any work, they don't, they're not turning the motor, but they, pl they allow for torque on a motor uh, to come from the, the power side, the, the current and the active power of it. So they magnetize the, the fields to get things going, but they don't actually do any work. And like beer, the utilities have to deliver the apparent power, the re real and reactive. So when I, I pour this beer, I'm going to get beer plus foam, okay? And uh, as we know, the foam, the foam doesn't do you much good. But the beer part, well, that's where the real, real power is. <laughs> so here's my, my beer analogy. Um, and like I say, the, the, you know, the, your, your beer distributor's got to give you both the foam and the beer. Um, the electric power company's got to give you VARs plus the active power. So now we go back, uh, oh, and how inverters can help regulate uh, the grid voltage. All the inverters inject current into the grid. They act like a current source. So they, they, they track the voltage and they inject current. But I can change the phase angle of that injected current relative to voltage. I can advance it or retard it relative to the peak. And by doing that, I can, I can either inject VARs or absorb VARs. Um, when I'm injecting VARs, um, I will tend to raise the voltage. When I'm absorbing VARs, I'll tend to decrease the voltage. And then inverters have advanced grid functions. That's what this, this compensation uh, scheme is part of an advanced grid function inverter. And, um, and they help regulate the voltage on the grid. So where does this come from? Well, the California Public Utilities Commission um, has, uh, is requiring all the independently owned utilities, the IOUs. Those are like PG&E, Southern California Edison, San Diego Gas and Electric. The, they're requiring them to use this, this rule called California Electric Rule 21. That rule's been around for, I don't know, 20, 30 years. Um, but it's been changed more recently to require advanced grid functions. Um, and I'll explain one of them here in a little bit. Also, the Hawaiian um, uh, Public Utilities Commission has a rule similar to California called Rule 14H, uh, which also requires advanced grid functions. And you say, well, why California and Hawaii? Why am I picking on those guys? And one of the reasons is because they have a lot of solar going in. There's high levels of solar, and they're seeing these problems where the PV is, you know, the solar generation is backfeeding those distribution lines and causing voltage rise. So now they're instituting these um, advanced grid functions to try to help regulate the voltage. Also, curiously enough, is that if inverters can regulate voltage, then the utilities don't have to. So it kind of saves them some money. They don't have to upgrade their distribution plants and put in more sophisticated equipment because they're getting some help from you and I that have solar on our houses. Um, also, nationally, the IEEE 1547 is, is under a new revision. Um, it came out in 2018. The test procedures are being worked on right now. And um, it's a national standard um, that the utilities uh, may adopt. Most of them will. Uh, and that has kind of the, you know, if you will, uh, advanced grid function version 2.0 in it. It's a little more sophisticated than what California and Hawaii had done. Um, but uh, that's coming out now. And then 
internationally, these reg regulations are already required um, to some extent. Uh, some countries more than others. Um, but it's, you know, everyone, you know, the inverters have this capability. Um, <coughs> utilities are picking up on it, and uh, it can help really help out. So let's look at a function that could help with that voltage rise issue. This is called a volt var function, and I've graphed it out here. So on this uh, x-axis, I have voltage, uh, V nominal, 103% of V nominal, and 106% and so forth. And then on this axis, I have VARs generated, either injecting VARs, overexcited, capacitive, or underexcited, absorbing, or inductive VARs. There's, these terms are all synonymous. Uh, overexcited, injecting VARs, capacitive, they all mean the same thing. And they're commonly interchanged. Um, so you have to kind of keep track of that. Same thing down here. They're, they're commonly interchanged. So what happens here is that I'm at V nominal, nothing's happening. I don't do anything. I, act, I, put, out, uh, I put out my current and phase with the voltage. But let's say the voltage starts rising, and I get out here to just above 103%. I start down this side of the curve. At this point, now I'm going to start uh, absorbing VARs. And that'll have a tendency to bring it back down to V nominal. So it's a way to regulate the voltage. It's helping to regulate. It's got a feedback mechanism in it, like regulation. Um, and then if the voltage goes up to 106%, well, we're, we're in a bit of trouble, and we're going to max out with the number of Rs that the, uh, the distributed energy resource can do. Kind of, we're going to limit it. Can't do this forever. So the, and, then, and then consequently, on the low side, uh, if the voltage goes down, we'll inject VARs to raise the voltage up, and that regulates it back to V nominal. So this volt VAR curve is pretty important. Uh, it's pretty easy to understand how this one works uh, on the, in the, uh, with the utility interaction to help regulate. There, there are other functions and, um, that do this, but this one looks pretty straightforward. Looking good? In the old days, uh, since uh, as you go down the line, uh, houses which have motors and so on are going to add more inductive. And usually, the companies used to put a bunch of capacitors at right. the end of the line so that uh, it, they would just compensate. Compensate. The yeah, yeah there, the, um, a lot of utility poles, you'll look up there, you'll see what look like small transformers. They're you know, so big around, yay tall. They're not really transformers, they're big capacitors. And those are VAR compensators. Um, most of the load out there is inductive. We have we got a lot of motors, um, air conditioners, refrigerators, your washer, your dryer, um, uh, your dishwasher. What else we got? Fans. Those are motors. So they have they have this magnetization uh, energy that has to go into it to get get things started. So they look very inductive. And um, so they have the utilities will put in. They have, they have different kinds of VAR compensators. There's static VAR compensators, which are just fixed capacitors that they, they, every once in a while, they'll stick some up there and they set them and forget them. You have dynamic VAR compensators that actually look at the voltage and will add more capacitance or take capacitance out, depending on what's going on, um, and, and so forth. So you'll see those. Uh, in fact, if we go back to this um, Example here. I, actually, these are these are VAR compensators right here. I I I, I showed them as being uh, connections to a transformer, but they're really VAR compensators. Anyways, um, whoops. So um, so we have a way to help regulate. And again, the utilities could 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 spend money to accommodate the solar, but they'd rather have the, gen the inverters help them out. It's a lot cheaper for them. So there's, there's a good incentive for that. Um, so with, vo with the volt var compensation, what happens is, is that we're able to bring the voltage down to a more reasonable level, even though we're still pushing back the same amount of active power, but we're, we're putting in a, a compensating element of reactive power to help mitigate that voltage rise. So here we, we We've been able to kind of smooth things out. That's one of the big advantages of, uh, of the volt bar. Okay, so 
There are additional functions that help with voltage regulation. Um, they're in the standards. Um, of course, we talked about volt var. Another one is called constant power factor mode, and that's just kind of a fixed value. And this is an example of constant um, power factor. Here again, we have on this, the hypotenuse here is the apparent power, you know, the reactive power, we have the real power. If you're at a high power, the, you get this outside triangle. But if you're at a lower power, you get this inside triangle. Notice that the angle stays constant. So that's, that's what a, uh, a constant power factor, I didn't really go into the math of power factor, but it's the, it's the ratio of these powers that give you the, uh, the sign of the angle. But anyway, so it maintains constant ratio between active power and reactive power. Uh, that is the sine theta uh, remains constant. The other one is called constant reactive power. Here I'm saying when I'm, when I'm at full power, I got X number of R's. When I'm at low power, I have the same number of R's. Um, and this is also kind of a fixed way of dealing with it. This would be a bulk way of dealing with this voltage problem, sort of like the fixed capacitors. Um, you're saying, I'm going to throw this many VARs out there, I don't, I don't care what's happening, but, um, but it's another mode that, that helps with their um, regulation. Uh, but as, as the power goes down, notice that the angle changes. So my power factor changes with power in this one, but the VARs stay constant. And then another one is called Watt VAR. I didn't graph that out. <coughs> watt VAR is the more power you put out, the more VARs you put out. Um, Utilities are, are tending towards this mode for the future, but um, not yet. <laughs> but isn't it that for the cosine factor, they usually want to reduce the war so, so that uh, you know, the, the meters you know, will not go? The, the meters uh, uh, ignore the, um, the, war, right? the VARs. Right. They, only, they only measure active power. But usually there would be more current now going in, and then that's that's to be the disadvantage of the pump company, isn't it? I'm sorry, I'm not I mean, quite understand. Uh, generally, whenever you have war, the war basically it can increase the, the, the some of the, the current, and then it's, it's going to be the disadvantage of the. Power yeah, power it's a it's a disadvantage because they have to generate more energy because they have to do both. They're always. They have to, when they generate power, they have to do, they have to generate the apparent power. So they want the VARs as little as possible. And make cosine uh, theta, I mean basically theta zero so that cosine would be yeah. one, right? Right, yeah. right. Or if we, um, uh, if I go back, go back to my can of beer. Um, so yeah, they have, to, they have to produce both the foam and the beer. You know, they have to produce both. So, and you know, geez, all we want is the beer um, and we'll leave the foam at the bottom. So that, and that's the same thing with VARs. I mean, it's like the VARs don't serve anybody. I mean, well, they do, they help motors and things like that. It's part of the, it's part of the reality, but, um, but the, uh, like I said, the power company has to generate apparent power. And the only thing that's doing work is real power. Oh, that's the other thing I wanted to mention. The real power is what you, they charge you for. Typically, unless you unless you uh, some like I would imagine um, things like a a laundry mat might get a extra charge because they've got a lot of motors in there, right? There's a lot of dryers, there's a lot of washing machines, there's a lot of motors all in one spot. Maybe they got to pay a little bit more for their power because there's a lot of a lot of motors, a lot of inductive reactants there. But typically, um, like in a house, um, you're getting charged for real power, but the utility has to generate the apparent power. Um, does it register at the meter at the house? Uh, the VARs? The, yes. the, the new meters probably do, um, the smart meters, but they can't charge you for the VARs. They can only charge you for the but real power. It. Unless you're in a special contract, you know, like maybe a laundry mat, you know. And then the laundry mat says, well, geez, I don't want, I don't want to pay more. So I'll go out and buy a uh, VAR compensator and stick it on there and reduce my, my VAR load so I can get back into the lower rate. Yeah. So that's what happens with big industrial complexes, um, large factories, things like that, that have a lot of um, inductive load or a reactive load will put in VAR compensators there because they, it'll pay off over time. It'll get them into a lower rate. They'll pay less money and they, uh, they'll pay for the equipment. But 
let's see what else I got. Kind of getting close to the end here. Uh, so we got vote var. We talked about that. We talked about the additional functions. So conclusions. Um, first of all, I, I want to mention that uh, harnessing energy from the sun is good for all of us. I mean, I think that's where we need to go. Um, I highly recommend to go into the solar field. Uh, I've been in multiple electronic disciplines over my course since I graduated, and uh, this seems to me this is the most rewarding. I really feel like I'm doing making a difference. And um, uh, there's a lot of good people that work in this industry. Um, also, I want to say that the regulatory changes uh, require advanced grid functions from uh, four connected, I should be four all connected, DER. Uh, excuse my typo. Um, so we know that, uh, you know, California Rule 21, Hawaii uh, 14H, IEEE 1547, they're all requiring uh, advanced grid functions. And uh, also when we manipulate the VARs at, at the distribution uh, energy resource, the DER, where we're generating, uh, we, can, uh, we can affect the voltage on the uh, distribution feeder. So, do, how do we do? Do we know what a microinverter is? Can someone give me a, a guess? I told you, I give you the questions and the answers. <laughs> Yeah, so I guess the key element there is that the microinverter is a small DC to AC converter, sits under, and each uh, panel has one, and then that combined AC power connects to the, to, uh, the house. Then how is power connected to the home or grid? We looked at that, we, we connect them together on a, on a circuit, and that circuit's terminated in a load center, and then that load center connects to the grid. And then the problems encountered with distributed energy, um, well, we saw that, you know, we have voltage drop without PV, we have voltage rise with PV. So we had, those are the problems, and how can we mitigate that? Um, by adjusting the VARs, we can compensate for the VARs of the transmission line or the distribution line, try to uh, zero out that effect. And then how is beer associated with VARs? <laughs> Any guess? Exactly. Yeah, you paid for the beer, yeah. but the brewer had to give you both foam and beer. <laughs> and they give us always uh, a, a, a glass is half full. <laughs> <laughs> so um, I have some resources. These are places I go to all the time. Um, the National Renewable Energy Laboratory. This is a really cool site. Um, go check it out. And they got a lot of really neat information. They're, I mean, man, I tell you, this is, this is the, the dream job to get a job out there. Um, they're in uh, uh, Golden, Colorado. It's a beautiful facility. They're uh, very scholarly. Uh, they do a lot of really good research and papers. Cutting edge stuff, I mean. But, and it's a national lab, uh, so. You're at the whim of the, of the budget, federal budget, um, but it's a really cool place. Uh, Solar Pro Magazine is another one. Uh, they have a, a monthly magazine. There's tons of great articles about uh, solar. Um, you know, not so scholarly, a little bit easier to understand most of the times. And then if you get into regulatory stuff, there is what's called the Solar ABCs. Unfortunately, this website um, is not being updated regularly anymore. Um, but uh, so the information's getting a little stale, but this has been a, a really good resource for me truly in the past. Might have to take that off my future slides. Uh, Wikipedia, I, I use that a lot. They have some really good pages about um, power factor and apparent power and, and all this reactive power, so uh, take a look at that. And if you're interested in the, the regulatory side, California Rule 21, which is in effect right now, um, there's a lot of good information about that. And of course, Enphase Energy has a bunch of really cool information about our products. I think Arizona also would have some, because yeah, it's quite sunny in Arizona. Also. Yeah, Arizona, yeah. Um, if, we go, if we look back at this, this map here, so this map is shaded for the amount of sun that, um, um, falls on the earth, and it's rated in kilowatt hours per meter squared. So you look here in, in like this, you know, northern Africa, I mean, you've got seven to seven and a half kilowatt hours 
So what's a kilowatt versus a, uh, a kilowatt hour? But uh, I just, sorry. you got a question? Yeah. Uh, uh, I, later, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you. Yeah, no problem. Uh, um, so kilowatt, a kilowatt is 1,000 watts. A kilowatt hour is 1,000 watts for one hour. So kilowatts tell you power. Kilowatt hours tell you energy. And so you get that much energy um, uh, in one meter squared. So a square meter is getting that much energy. That's a lot. Where is the source for this map? Uh, this one says solar GIS. Oh. Um, can't quite read it. It's kind of a little bit blurry there. But you, this map it is, is out there. Um, uh, and, and NREL has like uh, a gazillions uh, of these maps. They have like a tool that does nothing but this. But I'm going to show you a couple of interesting things here. Here's, here's the United States. Uh, you know, here's California. We're probably in this five to five and a half kilowatt hour per meter squared. Still pretty good. But one of the biggest countries uh, for solar is Germany. And look at that, it's green. I mean, that's equivalent to, you know, Newfoundland up here in the Northern Territory of Canada. That's how much sun they get. And it's one of the largest solar producers in the world. And they're able to do that with kind of feeble light. So it just shows you that you know, you can get a lot of energy out of the sun. You don't have to have the best climate for it. In fact, the best climate is higher up in elevation where the temperatures are lower and you get a lot of sun. So something like Denver, Colorado, that's at 5,000 feet and doesn't get a lot of clouds, will have, will have, actually has more generation than someplace that's really, really hot. Some of the other lectures that I did, we talked about some of the temperature effects on on uh, generating power from solar, but as things get hotter, you get less power out. Um, but if you're cooler, and also elevation is another thing, because elevation says, oh, I have less atmosphere, so I get more solar radiation coming down onto the module. So that's another thing that benefits a solar module is elevation. Okay, question. Um, at some point, will uh, the utility be able to control the, your, the micro inverters? Yeah. And like, mm -hmm. why, why would they want it to control micro inverters? Right. So good question. Um, part of the California Rule 21 um, is a section in there about communications. And they use another standard called IEEE 2030.5, 2030.5. <coughs> and then the California utilities have adopted a model um, that's kind of like a, that's a protocol. 2030.5 is a protocol. It tells you how to get commands through. There's another guide from, uh, you can get from this California Rule 21 page. It's called CSIP. Boy, I should know what that stands for. Uh, I'm drawing a blank. But that is what the, what the utilities are going to put into this protocol. What they're gonna, they're gonna, they define what we're going to ask for, what we're going to control. And why would they want to control that? Well, let's take a look at the situation. Let's say that uh, PV is running along really good. And they know that they, they can look at the weather and they go, geez, weather's going to be really, really hot coming up. And we know we're going to get lots of demand. So maybe we want to push up, push the VARs up even higher so that we can mitigate voltage loss. Or um, the, consequently, the other thing is like, hey, we're going to, run into some cool days, nice and sunny. Maybe we want to curtail all the PV so we don't put too much power back. So they have the ability to uh, control the output power, the VAR settings. And if we go back to this graph, they can actually change uh, the data points. They can move these inflection points. They can move the magnitudes of the VAR. They can change, put in another set of curves. Uh, when they, maybe they, maybe they got a curve setting for summer, maybe a curve setting for fall, one for, for winter. Would that, would that affect a, like a residential solar um, array and like how much money they're making if they're, if they're selling less power back to the Yeah, game? it can. Um, it gets to be kind of complicated. Um, uh, there's actually been some studies on that. Um, uh, uh, HECO, which is the 
Hawaiian Energy Company, Hawaiian Electric Company, HECO, in Hawaii, did a study with NREL. And they, they took a look at, um, at distributed energy generation, PV. In fact, it was a lot of Enphase sites. And they monitored that, and they took a look at how well does the VAR compensation work, and so forth. One of the problems is, is that if the voltage gets too high, the inverters will trip off, trip offline. And if you're offline, you're getting zero. You're not, you're not able to produce anything. So the VAR compensation actually keeps you from tripping soon, because you're going to try to regulate the voltage back down. Um, if you're at full power, if you're at full power, there, there could be a loss of, of active power to generate the VARs that you need. Um, but you only get the full power if all the conditions are right. The sun's at the right angle, uh, it's high noon, it's, you know, it's, the sun isn't too low, it's not in the winter, it's not too high, it's not, you know, doesn't have the right sun angle. So to get the maximum power, it has to be the right sun angle, it has to be the right time of day, and uh, then there could be some curtailment of the active power, but frankly, it doesn't happen that often. And this voltage compensation actually keeps you from tripping, which is, benefits you. So the study shows that you, there's, a, there's a benefit over time. Yeah. Yeah, question. Um, in a typical house, residential environment, maybe 5,000 watts of solar power. Mm -hmm. um, you say that microinverters that you guys have, each solar panel has one of them attached to it. Mm -hmm. I'm just curious if, uh, so that means many panels and many inverters. One of them misbehaves. How do you know which one it is? Uh, let's see, I, I talk a little bit about that. I had some other slides that I took out. Um, so each one of these um, solar modules on the roof, and it's really hard to see, but there's like little orange boxes. That's, that's an inverter on each one. And then the power line comes down and it connects into the load center, which I guess is over here. We also have a control um, box that, that ties into that. And it's able to communicate, and it's connected two ways. It's connected to the power and it's connected to the ethernet. And through the ethernet, it's, or Wi-Fi, it's able to talk to a server out in the cloud. But over the power line, it's able to talk to the inverters up on the roof. So we actually use what's called power line carrier, PLC, um, that um, modulates a, um, a frequency shift keying signal at around 144 kilohertz with a lot of forward error correction in it. I, that's how I got started at Enphase. I, I have I, one of my careers in the past was working at U.S. Robotics, the modem guys. If you ever remember dial-up modems, and so I'm familiar with modems, and so I worked on the original modems there that did that power line communications. Which so. takes me to the follow-up question: What does it take for us to have a setup in the house here that mimics your operation over there? So that we can use it in some laboratory oh, for yeah. students to, uh, you know, to see not many panels, but at least maybe sure. a couple. Well, then... that's the beauty of our system is that you can you can have one, yeah. or two, or four. So to get it going, you would need to you need to mount those modules someplace, right? And then uh, you would put the inverters underneath it. So someplace on the roof, for instance. Then you want to bring down your electrical lines to um, a, a panel board, you know, just a sub-panel. And there you'd have the AC voltage. That's, and then you would hook up our communication gateway. And that's it. What I meant was really a miniaturized version that you can, you don't put it out there for sunlight, but you, you maybe illuminate it with some Oh, uh, um, so as a in, inside, inside yeah, we do this in the lab, right? Yeah, so instead I'm... of a uh, PV module, we hook up a DC power supply. Yeah, let's hook up a DC power supply to it. And now you've got, you're simulating the, the PV module. And you just need a power supply that puts out about 35 volts and say, you know, 
up to eight amps, and you know that's our 300. Our our inverters are now we have uh, 350 watt inverters, so you could do 400 watts of DC power. So you have plenty of DC power, and then that will now it won't it, it won't our inverters today will not generate AC all by themselves. They have to be grid connected, and that's a requirement uh, from. IEEE 1547. It has to be grid connected. It cannot run by its own. Uh, it's a safety thing. So what's the output then? Well, it, it has to be connected to the grid. Its output would be current. So once it's connected to the grid where it can sense the voltage, uh -huh. then it'll push current in. And that's how it, that's how it, it exports power. We, it doesn't try to, it can't recreate the voltage. It has to follow the voltage of the grid, and it, it acts like a current source. So it kind of looks high impedance, so it just follows the voltage, but it can, is able to push current, or pull current, since it's AC, push and pull. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, so when there is the voltage fluctuation, uh, does it mean that, like for some sensitive equipment, you would need some kind of uh, signal conditioning or voltage conditioning? Uh, well, I mean, if you're connected to the grid, um, you're subjected to the down, yeah right? dips, uh, spikes, uh, nearby lightning strikes, um, you know, voltage spikes, surges, dips, swells. You're subjected to that now. Um, so equipment is, you know, like these computers, your TV set, uh, hopefully, if you've got a you know, good brand, then they've tested it over those kinds of conditions so it doesn't destroy itself. Um, the inverters, you know, I mean, I guess we can cause problems, but we don't. Um, if we do, it's very rare. I'm not, I'm not yeah. talking about just the inverters. In general, if yeah. you have voltage going down, mm -hmm. and then at the same time, let's say um, if people regenerate power of the photovoltaic, mm -hmm. then there is an upswing. Yeah, right? we're helping, so we're helping stabilize up, extra. These yeah. ups and downs yeah. would affect whatever. Yes, yeah, so we track, we track the voltage and right. Um, you know, I don't know, um, you know, my power supply to my uh, laptop um, might have, might draw more power at low voltage than it does at high voltage. Uh, I don't know, the efficiency is different. Um, you know, motors are affected by voltage. Right. Uh, in fact, a lot of times motors have um, uh, relays, uh, protection relays, that if the voltage dips too far, they'll shut off because they will draw a lot of current in a hurry because they want to keep that torque going. They want to keep the speed going. So the only way to do that if the voltage drops is to boost current. So, and it can go quickly because uh, it's more inductive, so the voltage can change very quickly. And um, so that's a problem for motors. Um, you know, and I don't know, I, th I also think elect modern electronics, when you, I go back 10, 20, uh, 20, 20, 30 years ago, computers were real susceptible to voltage dips. And we spent a lot of money on uh, surge protectors and, and pl outlets that would, you know, keep the, keep the power supply from, sense from uh, being connected to a low voltage. But I, you know, today's electronics have modernized. They're more tolerant. Um, but I, I have, I still have a plug strip at home uh, that I've had for ages, and I use it to power my TV and my audio visual receiver. And uh, if the voltage dips, it shuts off and won't turn back on. So you have to go manually reset it. But today's equipment is pretty tolerant to that kind of thing. More tolerant than it has been. There's another uh, spec out there. Um, uh, is it, it's not SEMA, something like that, I'm sorry, I'm drawing a blank, that was originally written for semiconductor equipment, manufacturing equipment, to specify um, voltage surges and durations. And because when the semiconductor industry was relatively new, their equipment was blowing up all the time and it was pretty expensive to get it fixed, so they put out these standards that then people had to design their equipment to, to tolerate dips and swells and things like that. But um, so there's, there's, there's some guidance out there on how to design your equipment. But yeah, you're right, hooking up to the grid is 
It's a nasty environment. It's not as stable as you think. Frequency is pretty stable, but until you go to some place like Hawaii, um, where it's all their gen their power generation is mostly from diesel generators, so they have engines running off diesel that are turning generators, and just like a car, as you're going up a hill, you start to slow down. So what do you do? You hit the accelerator. It takes a while to get back up to speed. Coming down the hill, you're going too fast. So what do you do? You take your foot off the accelerator, slow put less power in there. Well, that's the same thing that happens. They're free, and with, with, this, with these uh, diesel generators, as you speed up, uh, or as it slows down, let's say if it goes slow, the frequency goes low. As you're going down the hill and you speed up, the frequency goes high. So their frequency regulation is really bad because it takes a while to accelerate and deaccelerate these engines, these motors. And that's another reason why Hawaii implemented this advanced grid function to kind of help them out. Um, help them out with some of these frequency variations on there. There was a big event um, that happened, uh, it was like 2014, where the Hawaiian grid lost a transmission line for some reason, and, and uh, all, the, all the photovoltaics shut off because they saw the, volta the frequency go down, and they were told to shut off because that's the way we had them set up. Well, that was a real problem because they lost generation, which was difficult for them to recover from because of this transmission line. And then all the support they had from PV, they lost that. And so the voltage really dipped down and it took them a while to get things back up. It's hard for them to restore after an event like that. So that's another reason why these advanced grid functions are in there, to kind of help them ride through those events. And we, there's, there's, there's so much more to this. I just showed you one function, but there's all kinds of ride-through capabilities that are in inverters today. Um, there's, we didn't talk about frequency at all. There's a lot of frequency functions that are in there to help with the grid, but you know, lots to talk about. Anything else? Other questions? Let's see. So I guess we're done.